Hello and welcome to Mental Floss Video. Today we're going to be giving you some rock, paper, scissors tips, learning how to make the best paper airplane, and answering the question, what happens to paper after you recycle it? In this episode, all about paper, presented by Paper and Packaging, how life unfolds. Let's get started. Let's learn some quick facts about paper. Starting with some history. You've probably heard of papyrus. No, not the chain store. A plant that ancient Egyptians were able to turn into a paper-like material. The earliest we know they used it was about 2900 BCE, and they kept using it for about 4,000 years. Paper as we know it today was invented during the Han Dynasty in China, around 2nd century BCE, and it was initially used to wrap stuff like objects that needed to be moved and tea. A few centuries later, during the Southern Song Dynasty, it was used to make special envelopes for money. Paper money also came from China. It was in use during the Tang Dynasty. They made it from the bark of mulberry trees. Jumping way ahead in history, paperback books. These have been around since the 1800s, but became really popular around the 1930s in England thanks to a man named Alan Lane. He created a publishing house, Penguin, and printed 10 paperback books. They were already popular books by authors like Agatha Christie and Ernest Hemingway. Within a year, more than 3 million copies were sold. That's pretty crazy for back then. The next time you enjoy food that comes in cardboard packaging, you should thank a 19th century headwear craze for helping revolutionize how we get our food. The cardboard that helps package our food and so many other things can trace its origins back to 1856. Tall top hats were all the rage, and Edward Allen and Edward Healy began looking for a way to reinforce their stiff sides. Eventually, the pair invented corrugated paper as a way to fortify their stovepipes. By 1871, another inventor named Albert Jones had built on their discovery to create the corrugated cardboard we now know and love. Top hats turned out to be a passing fad, although I would like to bring them back, but cardboard was anything but. A marvel of engineering, corrugated cardboard is constructed from tiny arches known as flutes, which allow the material to resist bending and pressure from all directions. The fluting allows the corrugated cardboard not only to support a great deal of weight, but it also cushions the container's contents to prevent damage in transit. And you may not know it, but corrugated cardboard is formed from sheets of craft paper that have been crimped and glued and cut into this clever fluted design. By 1879, a Scottish inventor named Robert Gare had perfected a way to mass-produce folding cardboard cartons, and shipping history was made. As the 20th century began, producers of all kinds of goods began turning to cardboard packaging, but it was particularly useful for packaging foods. Today, nearly half of all the cardboard boxes created in the U.S. are used to ship foods from farms to stores. Let's get into some rock, paper, scissors strategy. There's no foolproof way to win the game every time, but it is possible to study the typical behavior of a person playing the game, because people are terrible at acting randomly. So to be better than average at the game, you have to be aware that your opponent is probably not being 100% random. There's a famous study on this from a Chinese university which was published in 2014. They had 360 students play rock, paper, scissors with each person playing a total of 300 rounds, and they got more money if they won more, so they were extra motivated. The researchers found that people did tend to play each option an equal amount, but there was a pattern. If someone won with a particular hand, say rock, they became more likely to play rock again. And if someone lost with rock, they'd switch. They usually moved in a specific order influenced by the name of the game. So losing with a rock would result in a switch to paper. A paper loss would mean changing to scissors. A different study published in 2011 found that it's common for a player to pick the hand that their opponent most recently played, especially for scissors and less so for rock. The researchers noted that this wasn't the case for paper. So that information can definitely come in handy. Aside from science, there are also true rock, paper, scissors experts that we can consult. In 2006, Graham Walker, director of management of the World RPS Society, shared some with Mental Floss. Apparently, there's a famous phrase to enthusiasts of the game, rock is for rookies. If you're playing a rookie, it's a good idea to start with paper. And if you're competing with a more seasoned player, try to catch them using that against you and go with scissors first. If you don't want to go through all this trouble because you have things to do, you could always try to trick your opponent with a robot hand. In 2013, a lab at University of Tokyo developed one that always beats people at rock, paper, scissors. People take around 60 milliseconds to move their hands, so the robot just needs to be a little quicker than that. It has a camera that takes 20 milliseconds to pick up on where a person's hand is moving and puts up the proper gesture to beat them. The AI will destroy us. 
Hopefully after using paper, you're recycling it. In 1993, more paper was being recycled than thrown away, and by 2014, about 65% of used paper was being recycled in the US. So we want to answer the big question. What happens to all that recycled paper? If you send all your recyclables out in the same bin, once they get to a facility, the paper needs to get sorted out from everything else. And that can be done with a huge fan. And then paper gets assembled into a bale and sent to a paper mill. That sounds like the easy part, but it's actually the most costly step. The paper then needs to get turned into something called pulp before anything else happens. This is done with a combination of water and chemicals along with cutting and heating the paper. The chemicals start to remove any ink, but de-inking is a long process that isn't totally finished until the very end. The pulp still contains things that were attached to the paper, like glue, which gets removed by straining and rotating, and the rotation step also cleans the mixture. And then there's a final de-inking. To make white paper, there might be bleaching as well. And then once the pulp gets completely combined with water, it's ready to become paper again. As for what can be recycled, we only get about five to eight uses out of paper. Eventually, it's not in good enough shape to be recycled anymore. Plain white paper needs to be remade from other plain white paper. Things like newspapers tend to be remade into stuff like tissues and cardboard and other newspapers. In Alabama, there's a facility that recycles old books into material that becomes paper towels and toilet paper. So that may be what happens to my books. If you're passionate about recycling, there are a few things you can do to help the process. Be sure to check that your community has a local recycling center near you, buy recyclable products, and do your part by recycling them. Let's talk paper airplanes. There is a lot of science that goes into folding a piece of paper and throwing it across the room. Thankfully, people have already done a lot of research for us, so we can use their information to make the best possible planes. There are four forces to keep in mind when you are flying a paper airplane. First, your plane is going to experience drag or resistance. While flying, it will inevitably be slowed down by resistance from the air that it's going through. If you make your plane narrower, it will experience less drag. Having wings that are tilted up will give your plane more more drag, but it might make its flight more stable, so you gotta find a balance. Then there's a pretty obvious force, gravity. Your paper plane has weight, so gravity will pull it down as it flies. You can use your knowledge of gravity to your advantage by experimenting with your plane's center of gravity. Different folds or even added items like paper clips and tape can ensure a better flight. The third force is lift. Lift is the force that holds an airplane up in the air. This happens because the air traveling over the plane's wing has an increase of speed while the air underneath the wing is slower. But just to be clear, the equal transit time theory that the the air molecules above and below the wing have to take the same time to travel is a myth. There's a difference in pressure that lifts the plane. It's kind of doing the opposite of gravity. While gravity tries to pull your plane down, lift is sort of pushing it up. The Exploratorium Museum recommends holding your plane up to a fan and finding its center of lift. When the center of lift is behind the center of gravity, it should have a stable flight. Then there's the final force, thrust. You have a lot of control over this because it's you throwing the plane. Whereas if you're flying a real plane, you gotta rely on an engine. According to John Collins, who holds the record for the farthest paper plane flight, a good thrust is about way more than just throwing as hard as you can. His advice is to start off gentle and keep adding velocity until you get the speed you want. By the way, to break the record, Collins had the help of a professional football player who threw his plane. So they technically share the world record. But let's get into some more general tips. Don't be afraid to use some tools like a credit card to make your folds extra sharp and try to keep your plane as symmetrical as possible. A former world record holder, Ken Blackburn, whose paper airplane flew for the longest time, recommends folding the wings up. He claims that a good plane will have wings that look like a Y from the front. And if your plane isn't flying straight, try reshaping the back. Now let's see if mine is world record ready. Thanks for watching Metal Floss Video, which is made with the help of all of these nice people. And thanks again to Paper and Packaging, How Life Unfolds, for sponsoring today's video. Please subscribe to our channel if you'd like to see more scatterbrained videos, and don't forget to be awesome.